Good morning to everyone, and I would like to thank Ian for the invitation. I wanted to be here. I was looking forward to it. Uh, uh, been looking forward to it since uh, December. When you told us initially we have seven minutes, you say, "Oh, how are we going to do that?" But what I find really interesting is the tremendous presentations before me. Uh, basically, leave me with not much more to say than ditto. So terrific, uh, the, and the themes are really coming out, uh, uh, and, and I just think it's exciting. Mais quand même, étant donné que j'ai préparé. But since I prepared something, let's go for it. So fasten your seat belts. So, as we all know, not that long ago, archives played a small and specialized role in preserving the official and unofficial record of human experience in specific jurisdictions. They supported unhur unhurried burrowing, as I said at the time, by historians and a modest number of other amateur and professional researchers, and to some extent, government officials and business employees. Today, archives underpin dynamic private enterprises, celebrity-based television shows, and international networks that transcend established geopolitical boundaries. The global leader in this new and rapidly expanding space is the multinational ancestry, and it's great to see them here today with us. And that's become a part of so many, uh, so many people's lives around the world. So how did this transformation occur? And why are we not living the golden age of being an archivist, of, of being in this world? Uh, I think it's something that we should uh, think about a bit. And so how did this uh, uh, unbelievable dynamic period evolve at the same time as deep challenges and, and a certain sense of threat uh, really transcend uh, uh, the our archival community? And I would say our question really is how can we build upon the good aspects of the dramatic changes we've seen recently and eliminate or manage some of these other aspects to ensure success in the 21st century. Our event here today is helping us address, and I think the presentations have just been terrific. And in, for my own part, I've had occasion over the years to focus on the interrelationships, particularly of archives, archivists, and historians, and what Jean-Claude Robert called in his presidential address to the Canadian Historical Association some years ago, Le Ménage à Trois. Uh, I think my central point today, though, that Le Ménage is not really à Trois anymore, and as we've heard a lot, it goes far beyond that, and I think that's really uh, a central point that we need to come to grips with. My own uh, initial intense involvement in this was from in the early 1980s, when I and other colleagues at the University of Victoria undertook the Vancouver Island Project, one of the first efforts to um, integrate uh, and bring together and address the challenges of and opportunities of archives, automation, and access. And there's a volume that we did out of the time that came out of a conference. Ian and others, uh, Terry Cook, were involved in that uh, with us. That project um, produced the first SQL, SQL application, in what we called, unfortunately, in hindsight, I wouldn't have done, used the same term, it didn't make us too popular everywhere, an automated archivist. Uh, for learning about the archival record of, of Vancouver Island. And in that process, we really suggested that uh, uh, new technologies were enabling new ways to think about uh, what had been separate institutions of archives, libraries, and so on. Um, and, and that met with some interesting reactions. Uh, some tolerance, uh, Terry was great, Dean was great, and others, but it was very controversial at the time. Um, and, and I think it's, it's interesting that we've got to pause on, on how that fits together. And since that time, I think I've continued to view with great optimism the potential for archives to play a significantly enlarged, centrally positioned, and consequential role And I think what is a paradigm-shifting era that is transforming the private, public, and nonprofit sectors across Canada. So the questions we're thinking about in terms of archives here are the same ones in many ways as the music industry, news media, on and on, I would say schools, businesses, and so on. My hope has been over the years that Canada could help lead the world, because I think we had a lot of advantages about this, and I think that hope is, continues. And we think back, and know that we've forgotten, uh, it's interesting, creation of the Machine Readable Archives Division in, in, at the Public Archives of Canada in the 1970s. Uh, and I'm obviously very proud Social Science Humanities Research Council became deeply involved in this, as Ian has said. Tom Simons was at the core of this when he was a founding vice president at, at, at SHRC. Uh, 
uh, and in terms of, of really imagining a, a, a greatly expanded and, and really fundamental role for archives in this new emerging world. And I think uh, Shirk, uh, obviously, with the research tools program and so on in the early 1980s, tried to support a lot uh, of this. I think it's also worth pausing on what I think is a, a really interesting step that we, we kind of sidestep a bit conceptually, and that is the fact that the administrative integration of Canada's National Library and National Archives uh, under Ian. Uh, and I think that offered the possibility of scaling up to a pan-Canadian and, and, and I would say international level that notion of, of uh, building an intelligent cyber infrastructure that could seamlessly respond to search queries with information not only about what historians call primary sources, but also about secondary sources. I think the bad news, though, is that the potential of these and other examples of Canadian leadership, I would say since the 1970s, have been realized really only partially. And today, I think we're all here because we sense the need to really refocus, reconceptualize, and reignite substantive discussion about what, what is really the role of archives? Where should they go? Uh, what are the next steps? And how are we going to get there? And I think this need is reflected in the fact that we have those two studies underway now at the Canadian Council of Academies and Royal Society. It's great to see Pat de Mers here, again, a, a great champion at, at Shirk, a member of council like, uh, like Tom was. So, so I, I mean, I think clearly this is a great opportunity. And so what I'd like to emphasize in my brief remarks is the importance of us understanding that the question of archives is being posed because of deep conceptual changes that are then being enabled, accelerated, and then influenced by digital technologies. But it's the conceptual changes that I think we've got to get out front. In other words, the fundamental issues at stake are not in the first instance financial or technological, which we've heard today. Rather, they're profoundly in terms of new ways of thinking. And it is these new ways of thinking that are making the financial and technological issues so important and so challenging, but also in which there's the possibilities of real forward steps. And I think the real problem is we have not really compellingly articulated what are those changes and how is that paradigm shifting and what does that mean? And I think that's the urgent priority. So what are the new ways of thinking? Let me just mention a few. And they've already come up in, in, in various uh, ways. One, obviously, the, uh, the role of archives in domestic life, my history. Ian Wilson used to say the first person singular. You, now you can say the first person plural as well. Uh, it's a fundamental uh, change, different way of thinking about things. The role of archives in the educational sector, we heard that from some of our speakers in terms of the notion of moving from uh, a transmission of knowledge model of pedagogy to, to uh, an active learning uh, engaged, engaged student, what does that mean? Undergraduate research on and on, the possibilities of there are huge. The role of archives in business, business intelligence, knowing customers, uh, the role of archives in government, we've heard a lot, accountability, legal, ethical, uh, transparency, openness, and so on. And the role of archives in civil society, nation building, enhancing rootedness, identity, to know ourselves, to celebrate ourselves, on and on. So everywhere we look, it seems to me, uh, there's increasing uh, uh, big changes that point at the end to archival holdings. What's interesting is a lot of this was completely unanticipated. The fact that we, in the late 20th century, the early 21st century, the amazingly increased public awareness of an interest in archival documents. Imagine around dinner table discussions now, people are aware of a census manuscript. They're aware of parish register. They're, who would have thought that, right? And I, and I think it's beyond what, if you had said in 1970, archivists, you know what? In 30 years, it's going to be common knowledge. Millions of people are going to be very familiar with the problems of record linkage in terms of 19th century. Say, really? Not possible, right? And, and that's where we are. So how, how did this, uh, you know, and I think, so, so, so what's interesting about this? It turns out that archives possess what is the increasingly important and sought after commodity today. That is to say, name rich historical documents. Turns out that that's really, really important. And, and as was just mentioned, people want to know about those documents in context. So what does that mean though? It means that uh, that context means that holdings of museums, galleries, libraries, on and on, all of that becomes part of, uh, from a user perspective, part of this new knowledge infrastructure. So it seems to me that the challenge for us is to take the, the organizational, the kind of vertical organizational structures and connect that 
make that horizontally connected such that from the point of view of a user, the respect for provenance and subject access and so on, that does not become an obstacle uh, in terms of, 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 the kind of, of the kind of use. Secondly, I think it's what's another, another dimension to this which is really interesting, is increased interest in and confidence about the ability to explain uh, and describe human, human thought and behavior. I think there's a new confidence now in terms of uh, figuring out about people. It's really interesting. I talk about this in education, schools. We built schools for 200 years, school systems. Never really thought about how children learn. Now there's a big focus on that. Businesses, they're all focused on learning about customers. Now in the health world, we talk about patient-oriented health. Schools now are all of a sudden about students. And I think there's, this all feeds into that. And as was mentioned earlier, archives have the big data. Uh, in terms of uh, thinking about uh, thinking about how we're going to learn about all aspects of of human beings in the past and present, another deep conceptual change: rethinking who is an expert, the crowdsourcing, the citizen science, the citizen historians, the 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 bl the, the merging of producers, users, creative consumers. All those, that's not because of the digital age, that's because of deep ways of, of thinking, of changing how we think about knowledge, who has it, who is an expert. And I think the digital is enabling these kinds of changes. So what's my point? My point is that we are no longer thinking about digital in terms of automating the analog world, but rather we're thinking about it in terms of very different thinking to support very different behavior, a, a, a deeply changed paradigm. So archives have big advantages. It seems to me from the start, archives were built in terms of user engagement. Archives never made a big effort to broadcast, for example. They don't have to back away, archives don't have to back away from that. I think by their focus uh, based on, on, on some kind of user engagement. Content is king. Archives have content these days, so that's key. But what I think is interesting is that the real value is, is, is the sense of the ideas and insights and approaches to the content and how to make that into something valued by others, and people have said this. So for example, Ancestry does not merely put the census forms up there and make them accessible, but rather they provide tools so that family trees can be built, individual biographies can be built from multiple sources, links and, and communities can be formed and so on. So that value added is really, really key. Well, how to move forward? Three quick suggestions, one I think, we really need to develop integrated, what I like to call a T-shaped approach, where there's a, there's a specificity, but it's part of something bigger, in which sources currently associated with distinct institutions, archives, libraries, museums, galleries, and so on, are conceptually recognized to be components of a comprehensive physical and virtual knowledge infrastructure, network digitally enabled. Two, to rethink how we work together uh, as professionals, and often we've been seen as separate, and I think that a lot of the professionalization of recent years hasn't always helped that. Archivists, librarians, chief information officers, for example, I would argue in universities, VP research, provosts, on and on, private sector leaders. I think we have to see ourselves, all of us, at some level responsible for, have a collective responsibility for developing, maintaining this robust and sustainable knowledge infrastructure that's really going to help all of society. And, and, and that we see this on campus, where still there's separate conversations, strategic plans in terms of libraries, in terms of the CIOs, and so on. We, we need to think about that in much more integrated, connected ways. And I think thirdly, archivists, in terms of moving from custodians to thinking about services, user-focused, to be really embracing the notion of being partners, collaborators, co-producers of knowledge, and really rethinking the value added possible of archives. So in the end then, I would say we re really need, it's a renewed call for a partnership of effort, an expression that's familiar in, in some of the wonderful texts that were prepared for this meeting, across all sectors. And, and I would extend that to auditors, info commissioners, privacy commissioners. Secondly, we need new kinds of, um, uh, I think we need to become part of uh, the whole world in terms of search algorithms, for example. Uh, how, how to study a million books, how to study a million documents and so on. We have to become part of that. Why? Because so much is Im being embedded in the software. So much of that is being done by somebody else. And I think at the end of the day, that's, that's not going to work well for us. We need to become partners with the computer scientists, with the information scientists and so on, and really embrace the challenge of, uh, uh, of really taking advantage of, of some of those new technologies and in keeping with 
uh, or I think our own uh, expertise. And uh, three, we need new kinds of measurement, performance results and so on. Uh, I think we need to think about our institutions and how we report on them in, in really updated ways. And I also think it's a time for experimentation. Uh, and there are lots of examples and I think we need to really foster that uh, because I don't think there's any cookie cutter, there's no obvious w ways forward. In five, I think we need international collaboration. Ian and others I know have been very big on this. Europe's doing really interesting things. We need to reach out and it's great to see a colleague from the US here. But I think this is, this is a global um, uh, adventure we're on and I think we need to be part of that. So it seems to me in the end, I think the real question for us uh, is can we harness the unprecedented in increasing public and private interest in the archival record? We somehow have to take advantage of that to create a robust and sustainable knowledge infrastructure for the 21st century and beyond. Merci beaucoup.